It's just a science project. Silent breed is people! You know, a doctor friend once said the same thing to me. Frankenstein was his name. It's alive! It's alive! It's alive! That sounds like something out of science fiction. Please explain to me the scientific nature of the whammy. We live in a spaceship, dear. So? Yes, science! Program complete. Enter when ready. Hey, Ed. Hey, everyone. And today we'll take a look at the most distant star ever seen. We'll talk about the new organ that's been discovered in the human body. And we'll wonder why puffins have fluorescent beaks. All that and how the Vikings used crystals to navigate coming right up. But first, you can help us make the show by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Choosing your level of support gets you different rewards, and we're very grateful to all the listeners who help us out. So a couple of weeks ago, the journal Scientific Reports published a paper detailing the, quote, structure and distribution of an unrecognised interstitium in human tissues. Bless you. (laughs) Now, according to a great many headlines, that translates to scientists have found a brand new organ. Joe, can we safely say that they have found something, but whether it's an organ is very much up for debate? That would be pretty accurate. Um, It's actually, it's quite exciting. But yeah, I agree. Um, Saying that they found a whole new organ is probably, um, I suggest, um, probably just a bit of press release media hype. Um, Surely not. Yeah, no, never. Never happened. (laughs) No. Um, and and the thing is, um, you know, uh, before we get into the specifics of the study itself, the, the the difficulty about this is that there really isn't a good definition of what an organ actually is. Um, it, it's it's one of those things where you know it's kind of like defining a planet. Um, sorry, Pluto. Um, <laughs> so um, so there is no sort of standard definition of an organ, although you know we, we've got kind of um, some some fairly, uh, you know, broad definitions that are accepted. But, but I suppose when you get down to the nitty gritty, um, there is disagreement between, uh, between scientists and, and biologists and so on. Um, and, you, and usually, I guess we would say that it's a, it's a part of the body that um, is, is, um, uh, has a specific function within the body and has certain parts which work together to fulfil that purpose. But then, you know, if you, <laughs> if you were to look at a cell, a cell, you know, has a specific function and certain parts that we can identify. So, you know, how, how do we actually specify exactly what an organ is? Um, and I think that for for the authors of this paper, it was probably, um, I don't know whether they use the term organ because, I you know, I read the paper and I don't recall them specifically using the word, but certainly it was a great one for the media. Mm-hmm. Um, now, getting down to what they actually found that in itself, I thought was really, really exciting. Um, and partly because of uh, my uh, my own um, uh, work when I, uh, you know, many years ago when I used to work in gastroenterology as an endoscopy nurse, um, you know, it was always really exciting to see new technology that was that was coming through that would allow us to um, to view the the, um, the gastric mucosa uh, with greater definition. Um, you know, some of the really interesting things that we were able to do that allowed us to diagnose, treat, and so on. And the way they've actually made this discovery is is through the use of a a newer form of of, uh, technology that is used in endoscopy called confocal microscopy. And essentially what happened was um, these researchers were uh, were looking at uh, the cells in the bile duct. So uh, if we're all familiar with our anatomy, um, within the the hepatobiliary system, you've got your liver, you've got your gallbladder um, and your pancreas, and you've got a, a network of ducts that um, join together and then empty out into the the duodenum. Um, One of the procedures that uh, that is done in gastroenterology is called uh, ERCP, or an endoscopic retrograde cholangiopancreatogram. Ah. Say that one six times fast. (laughs) Um, And and the purpose of an ERCP is to to treat and diagnose various diseases of the bile duct, the pancreas, and so on. Um, You can can remove um, gallstones that have uh, impacted in the bile duct. You can diagnose um, cancer. You can remove them. So yeah, actually- you can remove them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh God, one of my favourite things is, uh, is when we used to do... <laughs> yes, I know, I'm weird. This says a lot about you, Joe. 
<laughs> Two o'clock in the morning, going in on call for an emergency with a patient who's got, um, you know, a uh, um, biliary. Um, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? It's been too long. Uh, they, they've developed biliary sepsis because a, a stone's gotten impacted in the bile duct, and we can go in and through this procedure, we can actually insert um, tiny instruments into the bile duct, crush the stone, and then pull it out into the duodenum, and then and then allow the um, the bile to 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 flow. Um, you must feel like gods when you do that. that is oh, awful. it's so cool. It's like giving birth. <laughs> wow. <laughs> cool. <laughs> in, in what way specifically is it like giving birth? <laughs> I digress. <laughs> um, one of one of the frustrating things about these procedures, though, is that we we had never been able to actually look directly into the bile duct. So um, you you would put the the endoscope um, down into the duodenum, um, and then you would rely on fluoroscopy, so X ray, to be able to view uh, the bile duct. So you'd inject contrast into the bile ducts, and uh, and all your visualization of the ducts themselves would be uh, through fluoroscopy, not not through the the um, the camera that you can see, say the lining of the gastric mucosa. So anyway, um, what they did was they they've designed um, this tiny little um, confocal microscopic um, probe, which can be inserted directly into the bile duct, and it allows uh, allows them to uh, actually view the the muco view the lining of the bile duct um, microscopically. Now, what happened was when they did this, they found that the the cellular um, structure that they saw was quite different from what they had expected. So, um, essentially, we normally they would see um, you'd see the linings of the bile duct, and then underneath that you would see um, this sort of um, densely packed collagen. Um, uh, underneath that, what they actually saw was um, a fluid filled matrix. And this was quite strange because normally what they would expect to see is this very, very densely packed collagen. So they, um, they, they did some comparisons between the tissue that they would normally see uh, when it's excised. So, you know, if you were to, say, do a, um, a, a removal of the, uh, this part of the, the bile ducts and so on, there's a procedure called a Whipple's procedure, which is quite a, a major surgery done for pancreatic cancer where um, the due part of the duodenum, the head of the pancreas, um, the the gallbladder, all of these areas are removed. And typically when they would look at the, the lining of the bile duct, they would see the collagen very, very densely packed. And what they uh, concluded was that potentially what they were seeing um, what they were seeing when they actually excised the tissue, so, uh, you know, under the microscope, on a slide, was different from what you actually see uh, in vivo, so inside the body. Uh, the idea being that uh, this fluid-filled matrix, once it's act actually removed from the body, collapses, all the fluid um, uh, leaches out, and that's why you get this appearance of this very, very tightly packed collagen. And that says a lot about some of our sort of the assumptions we can make about the way tissue might behave, um, you know, when it's in a body as opposed to when it's uh, when it when it's dissected and removed. Um, and and this essentially is, you know, from a patho from the pathologist's point of view, this is what they've always seen. And I think this was just the assumption of what these tissue layers looked like. So the way they the way they confirmed this was that they they took some. Um, uh, they looked at tissue in other parts of the body because they wanted to confirm whether this was something that they were only seeing in the bile duct or whether they could find it elsewhere. And in fact, they found that it was throughout the body. So they looked at the, uh, they looked at the colorectal uh, tissues. They looked at skin. They looked at, um, you know, the, the urinary bladder all over the body. And they found that this, this type of structure was everywhere. Wow. So, what what what's really interesting about this is that the implications are quite dramatic for uh, you know, for example, and this was the area that I found really exciting, it's got major implications in oncology because 
one of the things that we're really, really, really interested in oncology is when and how does cancer metastasize? So when and how does cancer, does a cancerous, does cancerous tissue move from the point at which that cancer has started to other parts of the body? Because that dramatically changes the, our capacity to treat that cancer and the types of interventions that a patient might have to have and also whether that cancer is actually curable. And one of the things that they did was they had a look at um, this tissue, uh, or they had a look at the, this, the cellular structure uh, in a colorectal cancer, and also uh, I think they also looked at a melanoma. And what they did was they injected this special dye um, at the level of this, um, this collagen um, matrix. And what they found was, generally speaking, if you look at a report that, that comes back from a pathologist when, uh, you know, when a surgeon has uh, removed an area where there is um, suspected to be cancer, and one of the things they'll describe is something called lymphovascular invasion. And that suggests that uh, that can tell us whether or not the cancerous cells have spread um, into the, the vascular system and into the, the uh, lymphatic system. And that is an indication of whether the, a cancer has metastasized. And when they looked at these particular cancers, so this um, colorectal cancer and this melanoma, as far as they could see, this cancer had not um, had, did not demonstrate any lymphovascular invasion. So what they did was they injected a special dye um, into this, um, this interstitium and they found that um, despite the fact that there was no evidence of lymphovascular invasion, they actually found um, evidence of this dye that they had injected um, through, throughout the interstitial space. And, and I think they then found it uh, in a lymph node itself. Um, I might be, I might actually get be getting that wrong, but there was definitely evidence of the fact that actually this cancer could have been spreading through this, this, um, this matrix. So what it what it suggests is that there is more to how cancer metastasizes than than we thought. And I find that quite interesting because there was a paper um, a while ago. I think we might have even discussed it when I was on the show before, where they 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 showed that um, cancer often has uh, has metastasized a lot sooner than we think, but we don't know how. Um, and, and this was um, evident by, you know, people who have surgery and, um, you know, the expectation is that this cancer should have been completely removed, but then it comes back later. And th there's just a lot to suggest that, in fact, despite best efforts, cancer does actually metastasize a lot sooner than we think. And this, this discovery, this interstitium could provide another pathway for cancer to metastasize through the body. Right. So we think we've cut out all of, say, a prostate cancer or something, mm -hmm. or even the whole prostate as well as a cancer. Yeah. But then it comes back a few years later because it's maybe been lurking in this interstitium. Well, no, I, it's not so much that it's been lurking there. It's that, it's that we've been looking, we haven't been looking everywhere for it. Mm -hmm. um, so we've been looking... Uh, we, we're looking at certain tissue layers and the way that uh, because of our expectations of where we're going to find cancerous t um, cells. But in fact, what, where we haven't been looking is in this interstitial space. And by doing that, that could potentially show us that the cancer has actually already moved through that space. There could be, you know, some evidence of, you know, a few cancer cells floating around in that interstitium, which previously we wouldn't have looked at because we just thought it was this densely, densely packed collagen space. Now, if there are any, you know, cell biologists or pathologists or uh, anyone listening who is far more of an expert at this than I am, please, please, you know, let us know and, and clarify whether I've gotten that wrong. But that's essentially my understanding of, of how this would work. I think the other interesting takeaway from this is just that whole in vivo versus in a microscope uh, difference. Absolutely. Tissues can be different when you look at it at a, in a path lab mm. to how they actually are in the body. Mm, and mm. It's hard to know what other things at a, at a cellular structure might have that same effect. Yeah, very, very much so. And, and that, that says a lot about, you know, um, how, how we how we look at tissue and how we, uh, you know, our expectations about how things are going to behave. So, you know, in terms of the interstitium or, sorry, what we now call the interstitium, 
we've always had the term in medicine of the interstitial space or something that they call third spacing, which is where, you know, fluid. So, you know, you've got the different layers in the body of where, of where fluid is or the different, of the different areas of where we find fluid. So you've got your circulatory system, then you've got uh, fluid that's in your cells. Third spacing is what, um, is what, what we call it when fluid in the body moves outside of those areas into sort of um, the areas between those spaces. So when you get, if you've been on a, lo a, a long flight and you get a lot of fluid building up in your, your, your legs, or if you've got someone who's got heart failure and they develop what we call um, bilateral edema, which is where you get the swelling and sort of fluid seeping, that's, that's fluid that's moving into what, what is called third spacing. Um, oh. And so, you know, th this kind of thing has implications for that because, you know, it tells us a bit more about how fluid behaves in the body. Where are things going? What is it that's there? Um, I, I don't fully understand all of the, uh, the cellular um, mm. stuff that, that was described in the paper about the different um, behaviour of the, the, you know, there's a particular lining of this collagen layer that uh, behaves differently or that is, um, it, it's a bit different than sort of other um, cellular areas of the body. Um, but yeah, it's really interesting. And it, it, again, it's new stuff that we hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Do you think we may one day have some sort of a universal definition of what an organ is and maybe we'll you know, decide that the pancreas is no longer an organ or something and lots of kids will be upset and writing in <laughs> like they did Pluto? I'm sorry, pancreas. It's a pretty cool organ. <laughs> Why did you pick on the pancreas? I was thinking, surely the pancreas is pretty safe. Like, there's other lesser yeah, you know, exactly. useful organs. Like, you like know. skin. They say the skin is an organ. Mm. And to a lot of people, it's just a covering, surely. But it does stuff. Like, it does more than just cover. It's not mm. just a bad. It is. And the pancreas is pretty cool because it's like the only one that is both um, uh, endocrine and exocrine. Yeah, Ed. Yeah, I've often thought that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Let's move on. And when it comes to navigating at sea, over the ages, sailors have used a variety of methods from compasses and sextants to bird watching and the weather. The native Hawaiians even dipped their testicles into the water. Are you serious? What? I am dead you, serious. Are you serious? <laughs> and, 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 Absolutely. And, and, and what did they tell them? Navigate. Yeah. Um, I don't know the details of it. <laughs> That's what we should be talking about rather than this. <laughs> Sound real. I'm going to Google that while you're doing this story. I just can't believe it. Uh, okay. But nevertheless, <laughs> when it comes to the Vikings, we don't know very much about how they used to navigate. Well, a new study leads some credibility to a theory that they used to track the sun. Right, Shane? Yeah. Um, navigating by sun, as, as Ed said, you know, navigating by weather or whatever, it's it's similar kind of thing. Like, obviously, with where the sun moves in the sky, you can, or where we move in relation to the sun in the sky, however you want to look at it, um, you can navigate in a straight line or whatever that way. Unfortunately, that doesn't help you if it's an overcast day or if there's lots of fog around or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so, now, this is all very new to me. I'm not a, I've never navigated anything. Apart and you're from not a Viking. And I'm not a Viking. Um, I have trouble with Google Maps. So, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can only imagine how it would have been back then. When they, so the, the Vikings didn't have com compasses that showed magnetic north, so they wouldn't have known where to go. Um, there's been some, since the 60s, there's been this sort of idea that, um, that was pur purported by a Danish archaeologist, I'm not going to try to say his name, um, who said that um, crystals, like sort of translucent crystals, might have helped them navigate. Now, this at first just sounds like what? Come on, crystals. We've heard, we've all we've all heard this before. You know, well, they are magic. So yeah, you know, <laughs> the power of chi or some such stuff. <laughs> um, I don't know, <laughs> but apparently, it's all it's all has to do with polarized light. Now, I don't. I'm going to try to explain this as best I can, considering that I don't really understand it very well myself. Um, so, the sun. Um, Sunlight starts out as oscillating light in multiple planes. Polarization is what happens when you filter that light and, and, and it only moves in one plane. Now, on apparently on um, the sun, uh, even on cloudy days, there is like there are concentric rings of polarized light that are around the sun. That's due to the atmosphere that's between us and the sun. Now, apparently, if you hold up um, 
crystals to these crystals to like where the sun should be you can see that polarized light or you can see the light in one direction and that's so even on a cloudy day you'd be able to find the sun using this method holding it up to the sky and trying to find it and that way you could use it to navigate so it's it's a cool idea um and they they haven't found apparently they've never found evidence of these crystals in um viking archaeological sites but they have found them on in old british warships and stuff and so they think well okay this might have been a not just a viking thing but maybe a pre-magnetic north compass thing um or a sextant thing or whatever something that um, your experienced ocean navigators were yeah, aware of and apparently there are some old legends that refer to things like sunstones in norse sagas and that could be what these are referring to so it's an interesting idea um I, I think they'd need to test this and see if this actually works. I mean, they that, don't that's, just, what, that's what I was going to say. Have they actually, you know, tried to navigate using them? No. That's, <laughs> I think that's that's the next that's the next idea. So the idea would be to get from the fjords to Greenland. Apparently, they said using this computer simulation, there was a pretty high chance of getting within sight of Greenland. Now, <laughs> I guess that means you know, seeing land and saying, "Hey, we've made it. We're not going to die in this horrible icy ocean." Mm. Uh, now, I don't know, you know, would I want to rely on this? I guess you had no choice. You had no choice. I mean, we know that the, um, the Pacific Islanders went from island to island in little canoes without any sort of real direction, just going, you know, well, maybe we'll find land, maybe we won't. So I guess back then it was, well, we need to navigate. We need to find new land and new resources. We're just going to try this. And maybe this was a very well-known way of doing that. Have any of you watched the TV show Vikings? No. Or, no, no. A few because... episodes of it. I need to get back into it. It's on my watch list. I've seen them, I've seen them all, and this, this, is, this, this technique is actually used in that TV oh, show. Right. Um, huh? So the, the, the main protagonist of the, of the show um, is, is sort of becomes famous by the fact that he's the one who introduces this, you know, to their, to their, um, uh, to their technique. So he uses this initially to get over to England um so he can navigate through in exactly this position and the, and the idea was that the protagonist uh, you know would hold up the uh, um the crystal between themselves and the sun and by rotating the crystal um you could you could figure out where the sun actually was exactly mm -hmm. so based on the the different orientations of light because of that halo that that Shane mentioned which is caused by the sun's uh, the sunlight coming through our atmosphere is what causes it to sort of form this the, these concentric rings and that and that's Basically, that that polarization is is what you're 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 detecting with the with the crystal because it, it it's showing you one one direction of the light. So if you as you rotate it, you basically can figure out where the center of that light pattern is, and and that was the that was the approach. And then from that, you can um, you know there were a couple other things that were involved with this floating board and a and a shadow and a couple other things. Okay. But yeah, it, I mean, it seemed believable in the show. I didn't even realize it wasn't. Wasn't yeah. confirmed. I just assumed it was that was no. Confirmed. Apparently, it's not confirmed. I, I mean, I, I don't know if. I mean, again, this theory has been around since the '60s, so possibly, you know, this has been a well-known thing. I, I, I don't. I know nothing about Norse um, voyages or navigation or anything like that. Um, what? What? One researcher who is not attached to this study, um, who is actually an animal vision researcher. So I don't know what they <laughs> really have to do with any of this, but apparently, this person um, has Amit Lerner from a researcher based in Israel has said that, well, look, this is possible, but tiny little mistakes in this could lead them to go astray by, you know, huge distance. I assume, I assume an animal and vision that's... researcher probably just w would have a really good understanding of light and the way I light. Guess. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I but mean, also, yeah. and that's one of the interesting things when I was reading the article, I noticed one of the authors is Gabor Horvath, who we've talked about before on the show because he won a 2016 Ig Nobel award. <laughs> Or for finding out why uh, white horses are less likely to be bitten by horse flies, and it is to do with uh, that's polarized right. I remember light. That one. Yeah, I remember that. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. and also zebras. Uh, the, their pattern may be designed to make them less likely to be bitten by horse flies. So, mm. yeah, polarized light is actually a really kind of cool thing, and yeah. we see it in more places than we'd expect to, I guess. And it does say in this article that some animals like ants and crickets can detect polarized light. So that, that could be the link there as yeah. well. And, and mantis shrimps. <laughs> mantis shrimps, yes. Mm -hmm. Is there anything a shrimp can't do? <laughs> I almost said exactly that. 
and, and apparently the authors do hope to actually perform a round trip voyage between Norway and Greenland using these sun compasses and sunstones to see typical work. scientist anything <laughs> for a free holiday they're just trying to yeah taxpayer yes. funded vacation <sighs> Okay, Lucas, astronomers have once again dusted off the Hubble Space Telescope and pointed it at some space, and they've spotted the most distant star ever seen. Tell us about Icarus. Icarus, from Greek mythology, Icarus was the son of Daedalus, who was the, uh, the master craftsman who built uh, the, the labyrinth of, of Minotaur fame. And, and um, Daedalus had, had uh, constructed wings in, in the mythology of um, of wax and, and feathers and, and he and his son has escaped Crete and he, he warned his son not to fly too close to the sun or too close to the, the water and, uh, and his son Icarus, the young upstart. They never listened to their fathers, did Never they? listened, so he died. Uh, sorry, <laughs> a bit spoilers. Spoiler, jeez. <laughs> yeah, so um, so Icarus, in, in the, I can see why they're calling this Icarus. So the official name of this star is actually um, MACS Max J1149 plus 2223 Lens Star 1, which is, it does Icarus roll off. does roll off the tongue of the <laughs> <bit. Yeah. laughs> Exactly. I can see that. So, uh, yeah. So basically we've seen things further out. That this, is, uh, this is sitting around 9 billion light years from Earth. Now we've seen galaxies lensed galaxies that are further away than that but we've not seen any individual stars that are uh this far away before and it was it was basically a lucky encounter they were studying um they were studying another object they were studying some some um some galactic clusters and it just so happened that there was an alignment of of some massive star within one of those galaxies within the clusters they were looking at which then happened to then lens along with the 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 um the gravity of the clusters combined, it happened to lens this star in the background um, basically a couple of thousand percent, which is which is very handy. Um, so this is roughly a hundred times further away than the next most distant individual star we've we've seen before, we've observed before. So it's, yeah. it's a pretty big deal. When you say individual star, and you were talking before that we've seen galaxies that are further away, so this is a rogue star just in interstellar space, or is it part of a galaxy, or how does that work? No, it'll be it'll be part of a galaxy. So, well, it doesn't actually say in here. It just says, uh, yeah, it didn't actually say exactly where it is. But this is a a single star that they're seeing. And of course, we can get to that from spectra and so forth, where we can say, okay, this is the the individual makeup of it. So this is how they figured out that it's actually a blue supergiant which is quite a rare type of star, actually, but um, it's very, very luminous. It's thousands of times brighter than, than the sun. Um, so it's a very, very bright star in the first place. But, uh, yeah, the big deal about this is that it's, it's basically, it's so freaking far away. Mm. So um, this is also then makes it the oldest single star that we've ever seen because its light has been travelling for 9 billion years to reach us. Now, in that time, the galaxy has also... And not just the galaxy, sorry, the universe has also expanded significantly. So uh, we're seeing where this star was 9 billion years ago, not where it is now. It's probably much, much further than that away from us now. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but, yeah, basically uh, more than 2,000 times um, um, uh, magnification through gravitational lens. And we've talked about that plenty of times on the show, so I won't go into details of how that works. But uh, it's, it's just a, a really nice... A nice one that popped up, and once again from Hubble, which just is the, is the, is the little telescope that could. <laughs> keeps on giving. But also just the chances of another star happening to go right in the way just when they were looking at it, that sort of coincidence of that effect even happening is pretty rare and Yes cool and no. And I mean, when you consider that we're, we're always looking at something through multiple instruments, um, and obviously Hubble has some advantages uh, as, a, as an optical instrument. It has some advantages of being out in space. But, um, but this gravitational lensing effect, considering we're always looking at things, we've seen quite a lot of things gravitationally lensed. So, um, you know, it's not that bizarre, I guess, that we'd see it. But what, what is particularly uh, unusual, obviously, here is just how incredibly far away it is. Um, that no, most stars are, are, are magnified are, apparently with this sort of effect around 600 times. It's just due to the fact that the cluster itself that went in front of it to, and the particular star that was in front of it made it a, um, just a, a perfect alignment, a perfect timing, and, 
and uh, and the fact that it was all being you know collected, the data was being collected at the time as well, it was very cool. Awesome. Okay, let's move on. And Kaiser Health News is a non-profit news service focusing on health issues. And they've just launched a huge database tracking pharmaceutical companies and where they spend their money. In 2015, Big Pharma spent $63 million in political lobbying activities in the US. But in the same year, they gave almost double that, $116 million, to patient advocacy groups. Joe, first of all, what is a patient advocacy group? And is this kind of spending something to be concerned about? It is something to be concerned about. So patient advocacy groups are um, essentially uh, groups that represent um, patients either with a specific uh, disease or or medical condition or generally represent um, patient interests uh, more broadly. Um, And, you know, you you would see them, you know, all over the place from, you know, raising, generally raising money uh, towards research or, um, you know, trying to promote the public interest in in, um, lobbying for better treatments, better access, better care and so on. Uh, you know, an example would be I, I, I've noticed in in the last few weeks, there's um, there's been a huge amount of um, media around uh, endometriosis, for example, um, and I was quite curious about how that's come about. And I suspect that there's been a really concerted effort by uh, the the patient adv- advocacy group for women with endometriosis, which has resulted in the media giving uh, more attention to a disease that doesn't get a lot of attention. And the thing is, patient advocacy groups, God, that word is very difficult to say. It is not easy, is it? (laughs) (laughs) So um, patient advocacy groups are incredibly important because there are a lot of um, uh, medical conditions out there that don't get a lot of support or, um, you know, there are patient groups that are particularly vulnerable to uh, getting lost in the system. Um, and and these kinds of groups can, can really contribute a huge amount to, A, increasing public awareness by uh, lobbying uh, government to, uh, to, to push funding towards research for that particular area or, you know, providing better resources, um, you know, all, all sorts of things. So, you know, in no way uh, do I want to in any way say anything negative about patient advocacy groups aside from the fact that like with any um, any condition, you know, sometimes they, they can do harm when we look at things like uh, Lyme disease, for example, and God, I'm sure I'm probably going to end up getting in trouble for this. But um, you know, uh, when we when we look at conditions where um, you know there's there's um, maybe not um, you know a, a good evidence for um, the condition as it's been described, or uh, you know when we get things like, for example, uh, the the condition Morgellons disease, which is where patients um, believe that there are sort of these strange threads and so on that are in their skin. And it's a very unpleasant experience, but there's no actual sort of scientific evidence for the existence of the disease. But if you've got a good advocacy group, you can really end up kind of, you know, attention towards or funding towards something that, um, you know, maybe uh, really doesn't warrant the funding that, that, that is, is pushed towards it. Now, if we, Pull back to uh, this database that this group, um, Kaiser Health News, has um, has compiled. They've looked into, as as you said, Ed, they've looked into the amount of money that uh, pharmaceutical companies um, give to uh, to various groups. And you know, there's been a lot of interest over the years in in where pharmaceutical companies uh, put their money. Um, there, there's been a lot of work over over the last um, ten to 20 years looking at uh, the influence of, of um, drug company uh, money on, uh, on prescribing practices and so on. Um, and, and what they found was that a, a large amount of money, and they're talking uh, at least $116 million in a single year, has been directed towards patient advocacy groups by, uh, by pharmaceutical companies. And well, why, why would they do that one? Would ask what 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 is the the purpose of of uh, of a pharmaceutical company directing money towards a patient advocacy advocacy group? Now, 
on on the one hand, you know, there are probably some good reasons. If you want to, if you want to, um, you know, look at it from a positive point of view, you could say that, you know, a pharmaceutical company that is doing research into a particular disease um, are going to have an interest in the patients who uh, suffer from that disease. Um, it's important for patients to actually work with these companies to ensure that the research they're doing is actually patient focused and not, you know, that the, um, for example, that the study endpoints in their clinical trials. Um, um, are actually relevant to the patient group that the the drugs are are, are targeting. Um, so th there's a lot to be said for for patients having or consumers having relationships with these companies. However, the the worrying side of this is that pharmaceutical companies can push the direction of lobbying. So if a particular patient advocacy group um, is really keen on a particular drug, uh, for example, uh, going on to the PBS in Australia or uh, the equivalent in, in America, and you get a lot of attention directed uh, towards the government by that patient advocacy group, you've got a really, really powerful voice there to influence the way the government um, handles the registration of that drug um, and essentially um, that, that has an influence, of course, on the, on the bottom line for the pharmaceutical company. And so from an ethical perspective, this, this is really problematic because while patient advocacy groups want the best thing for that that patient population, it doesn't necessarily mean that the drug they're lobbying for is actually the best thing. You know, th there are a lot of examples of where uh, there are drugs which we, which the evidence has shown are effective and um, and due to the astronomical costs of the drugs, the government doesn't put them on the PBS and that is very, very problematic as well. So, I saw last week, actually, there was an example of um, a drug for cystic fibrosis that um, has been shown um, to be incredibly helpful for cystic fibrosis patients. And uh, and from what I can see, the evidence is there that, that it is beneficial, but the government has not is not funding uh, the drug. I think that I think they're not putting it on the PBS from what I read. But, you know, if you get an example of, say, uh, a patient advocacy group pushing for a drug to be put on the PBS because the patients are desperate for that drug, but perhaps the evidence base isn't really there for it, uh, then you're, you're risking pushing much needed funds in a direction that maybe they shouldn't be pushed in. The, what's so sort of distressing about this is that in, in so many cases, these groups represent patients who are desperate. They're desperate for cure. They're desperate for relief. And they, you know, these groups know their, their patients and the, and the needs of their patients better than anyone. But, um, but you've got to worry when there's that influence of a pharmaceutical company, could they be pushing things in a direction which maybe the evidence isn't there? Or could it be pushing things very much in, you know, with self-interest? So there was an example that they um, they gave in uh, in this uh, article of um, one one of the things that can happen, of course, is you know with with patents where uh, where where a drug uh, drugs patent ends, and then you've got the possibility of other companies uh, creating um, generics. And there was an example that they that they gave of a patient advocacy group who were pushing very very strongly for uh, the generics of a particular drug not to be made available, which is odd because it's really sort of, it's contrary to um, the patient's interests when in all likelihood having the availability of these generics is going to actually be beneficial to patients because of the cost of some of these drugs. Um, and from what I could see, if I read this correctly, the, the reason for this was that they were claiming that, in fact, these biosimilars were were uh, were going to potentially not be as effective, or there were going to be risks involved, um, and and I don't know that there was actually evidence that this was the case. And where you've got this very, you know, strong influence of a particular um, pharmaceutical company, how much influence is going on there? So, so that essentially is the concern. And there are, of course, uh, when, when you actually look at some of the, the graphs that show, uh, you know, the, the amount of money that has been spent here, um, it, it's, it's astronomical. It's, it's really huge amounts of money and, uh, and far outspending some of their money on, um, on, uh, on lobbying as opposed to patient mm. advocacy. It, it's it basically it is lobbying, but through a third party. It's, it's lobbying through a third of, party, exactly. It's it, indirect. It's sort of like the uh, the Citizens United ruling, where companies are forming these packs 
these third parties to do their lobbying for them. It's a similar sort of thing to that. It's this way of hiding the money that they're spending on it. Oh, yeah. And, and, and as you say, it is this indirect lobbying. And one of the, <laughs> when you've got desperate patients and, and, and patient stories, and we know patient stories are far better than any data, then hmm. you've got a very effective tool to be able to manipulate the, 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 the response you get to that lobbying. And it's also, it's not just the political side of things. Uh, these advocacy groups are also the first point of call for a lot of patients when they're diagnosed with a disease. They might go to the American Diabetes Association or Arthritis Association or something to get their information. And if they're getting recommendations for things that are skewed somewhat, mm. then that's a, a further complication. Absolutely. And, I, and the thing is that, you know, it's one of those situations where um, t from an ethical point of view, it, you could you could find a way to actually justify it in that okay if a particular pharmaceutical com uh, company is is um, working with one of these advocacy groups and they do have a very effective drug and the the result of the lobbying by this advocacy advocacy group means that patients then do get access to a drug that is actually going to benefit them then okay what's the problem well it's mm. the, it's the other side of it it's where it's where yeah. the the where the lobbying is for something that maybe shouldn't be lobbied for mm. so really it's about then maybe the response is to create systems where at least there's transparency and there's kind of you know um uh, oversight of what's going on rather than saying it's not allowable yeah you need to have some regulation i guess mm. and some sort of distance between advice and lobbying that the advocacy group does and the money coming in but Absolutely. that's a difficult thing to uh yeah, enforce, yeah and look I think. and look in fairness you know you got to also when you look at the time it takes for drugs to um, to to be moved onto the PBS when the evidence is there, and I'm saying I'm using the PBS as an example, obviously because we're Australian, and you know I'm sure it's no different with the FDA and so on. But um, the, the the time it often takes to get a particular treatment moved um, onto the PBS is 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 just it can be years and years and years. And when we look at some of the the cancer drugs, what they what they cost, you're looking at you know a hundred thousand um, dollars. For, for a year's worth of treatment in some cases and, and patients just don't have that. So you can understand the desperation. Um, mm, definitely. Yeah. Well, we will keep an eye on it to see if anything happens, but it is somewhat worrying. Now, Shane, puffins are adorably awkward little birds famous for their large beaks. And one of the first things someone notices when they see a puffin is that their beaks are not fluorescent. <laughs> Except they are. We just can't see it, can we? <laughs> yeah, I've, I've never looked. At, I've never seen a puffin in real life. I've, I've, I've only seen pictures, and um, yeah, I've noticed that they are not fluorescent. I never would have come to that conclusion because it's anyway. Uh, yeah, puffin's beaks, as Ed has um, inferred here, are very bright and colourful, and they're also ridiculous looking. Everyone, everyone says they're cute. They just they're so cute. They look they ridiculous. So you're wrong. They look ridiculous. Anyway, and and, <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I always assume you know, that something like that would be like a display thing. I'm not sure if both females and males have them, um, but they are very brightly coloured. And usually in the, in the animal world, this is a sort of a display thing, like you know, for mates or for you know, back off. This is my territory or whatever. Um, what this researcher has noticed is that apparently if you apply UV light to them, to dead puffins, um, he's, I don't think they've tried it on live ones yet because, you know, shining UV light on a creature, it's not great. Um, they light up. And it's not, not, not the whole beak, but the, the ridges on the, on the, um, the yellow ridges on the puffin's bill, which are called the cere, they light up under UV light and, and they emit the light. It's not just sort of a reaction. They actually take it and then emit it back out again. So the question is why? Why would this be happening? And what do the birds see when they see this? So obviously birds will see diff things differently to what we do. And it's probably not, they're not probably not seeing UV light because that really, well, I mean, it wouldn't happen like as a, well, they, they said it wouldn't be like a headlight thing because that's in the dark and UV light doesn't exist in the dark. Um, we don't know what birds would see when they look at this because we don't really understand birds' vision in the, to that extent. So, so it's not generating the light. No, it's really it's, reflecting. Yeah. The UV light. I yeah. mean, yeah, we so yeah, you know, we see red, blue, and green, and birds have a fourth colour in the mix that they see. But I think due to an extra cone in their eye or something. 
Um, yeah, so the question is, what, is, what are they seeing and what, is, what does it mean and what's it for? And they don't know. So what they're going to do now is, <laughs> I love this, <laughs> they're going to try it on live puffins. What? To ensure that they don't damage, the, they're going to put sunglasses on the puffins. Oh, my God, that is, that is so cute. <laughs> ridiculous. A picture, there is a picture in this news article <laughs> that Ed sent us with this. And I don't know, I, I think this is a live puffin that they've put it on. There's, there's a picture of a puffin being held by a, a gloved hand and there's this <laughs> pair of, like, shades on the side. I'm sorry, but that's not a sunglass. They're not sunglasses. No, sun blo- a sun block of glasses. A shield over yeah. the eyes. Yeah, pretty much. So, so they're going to test this and see if... I mean, for all we know, this could... I mean, it's, it's unlikely, but it could just be a dead puffin, you know, like a breakdown in the beak or something, and then it... And, you know, oh, that yeah. Causes, that causes... They're coming back to the difference between, you know, a microscope tissue sample for an interstitium and the actual... Indeed. And in vivo, yeah. Um. I, what I like about this is that apparently um, crested auklets, they're in the same family as puffins, and they can do this too. They have light-up bills. So, yeah. But apparently, the, the I love this line in the article. The researcher was having a troubling time in the lab, so he just decided to throw some UV light onto a dead puffin. As you do. I'm like, okay. I mean, I, I've done some... When I've been frustrated in the lab, I've done some things that I wouldn't normally do too, but I've never done anything like that. I wonder if all the listeners are now wondering what you've done in the lab. Uh, that's, that's for me to know. Because I am. I'm sure that there are things that really shouldn't be said publicly. That's, that, that's, that's for me to know. And I think that's our show. And as usual, you can find all the links in the show notes or at scienceontop.com slash 292. Please leave us some feedback there or get in touch with us on social media. And if you can, can you please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts? Or any other podcast reviewing place that's not yeah. Apple. I mean, yeah. True. Apple is still the, the big one that gets the most uh, attention, but absolutely anywhere where you listen to this, you should leave some comments. Don't forget, you can always help us out by going to scienceontop.com slash donate and pledging to support us on Patreon. Thanks for joining me today, Shane, Joe, and Lucas. No worries, Matt. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, everyone, for listening. We'll be back again next week, putting science on top of the agenda. Join us then. But they have discovered something called the inter, uh, interstitium. Okay. The interstitium. And apparently it, it's all over our body. It, and the reason scientists couldn't find it is because even the best microscopic telescope, or microscopes couldn't discover it. They found it in, in with uh, digital imaging. Yeah, we, and we still need, the, we haven't found a, uh, a cure for cancer. Yeah. So we still need to, to dive into our body more so and to learn every aspect of it. Oh, man. Yes. I'll tell you, my interstitium is, is bothering me this morning. Really having trouble with it. My interest in Let me pinch morning. it. <laughs> All right. <laughs>